like to uh, start the second part of the proceedings. Uh, just very quickly to recap, uh, in the second half it will begin uh, with Rob uh, giving a 10 minute response to uh, what Paul had to say. And then Paul will have a, an opportunity for 10 minutes to respond to what Rob uh, had to say. And then there will be cross-questioning and I'll try and guide you through it. That's where my job becomes even trickier. Uh, and then after the cross-questioning, they will each have an opportunity to summarize uh, about five minutes each. So again, I want to thank you for the way that you listened so well in the first half. And uh, again, I would ask for uh, similar uh, during our second half. So I think, really, without any further ado, uh, I would call upon Rob Zins to make a formal response now uh, to what Paul had to say about the road of Roman Catholicism. Okay, thank you, Cecil. I'd like to begin by responding to some of the comments that my opponent has made this evening in reference to baptism. And I direct your attention to the 14th chapter of the book of John, and I'm going to go through this as quickly as I can, and I hope that you can understand me and follow me. In John 14, 16, we read this, beginning in verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now this promise of the Father to send the Comforter, the Spirit of God, is repeated again in John 14, 26, John 15, 26, John 16, 13, and 14. It is known as the promise of the Father to send the Spirit of God. Now the question before us is, can the Spirit of God be called down from heaven through the manipulations of a sacrament. It is the Romanist contention that in the waters of baptism, the Spirit of God is called down out of heaven and enters into the heart or soul of, a, of another human being. Now, if we go forward in our Bible to the book of Acts, and we find ourselves in the very first part of the book of Acts, we find in Acts chapter 1, in being assembled, verse 4, together with them, our Lord commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, speaking to the disciples, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard from me. So our Lord is reminding his disciples, wait, the promise of the Father is going to come, as he had promised them in John 14 and 15 and 16. The narrative goes on. Our Lord says in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And all one has to do is turn the page, chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. The promise of the Father, excuse me, the promise of the Father had been fulfilled on the day of Pentecost to these disciples. There is no water present. There is no baptism present. What? so ever because the Spirit of God is free and God sovereignly sends the Spirit in fulfillment to his promise so we see that the baptism of the Spirit occurs historically in the book of Acts without the agency of water it is further defined in Acts 217 and Acts 233 without any water whatsoever and as the book of Acts unfolds the Spirit of God falls upon God's people quite apart from the agency of water. In Acts 8, 9 through 17, there is water, but no spirit. In Acts 10, 44 through 48, there is spirit, but no water. And if you go all the way through the book of Acts, and you all the way to the Acts 19, including Acts 19, you will find out that there is no connection by way of cause and effect with water and spirit. You'll find places where there's water, no spirit. Find places where there's spirit, no water. And of course, baptism cannot bring about the spirit 
in the life of anybody. All in all, the book of Acts presents us with three primary terms which speak to candidates who are going into the waters of baptism. Repent is used six times, turn is used 11 times, and believe is used 39 times. Whenever water baptism is used, it is used with one of these terms. Either repent and be baptized, turn and be baptized, or believe and be baptized. Never, ever in the entire New Testament is baptism used alone by Luke in the book of Acts or his gospel as the sole prerequisite for the reception of the Holy Spirit. Never. However, over and over and over again, turn, repent, and believe are used all alone for the reception of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, baptism does not bring about the reception of the Holy Spirit. And it's the Catholic contention, Roman Catholic contention, that it does. But you cannot verify this nor substantiate this from the Word of God. None whatsoever. A passage was referred to, and I want to take you to that passage, 1 Peter chapter 5, in which my opponent said, and corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. And he stopped right there. Let's read the rest of the verse. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but what? An appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's not an infant alive that can appeal to God for a good conscience. There's not an infant alive that can turn and repent. There's not an infant alive that can believe for his salvation. And yet, even here in 1 Peter 5, when he uses the analogy of the um, days of Noah, when Noah and his family were saved, in the ark through the waters, and the ark is a type of Jesus Christ, Noah and his family are in the ark. We are in Christ. Noah is taken safely through the waters, and by symbolic representation, those in Christ are verifying this through their journey into the waters. And there is about as much water in Romans chapter 6, another passage that was quoted this evening, as there is in the Sahara Desert, I assure you. All of Romans 6 is centered around being baptized in with by the Spirit of God. The baptism there is a spirit baptism. It is not a water baptism. So I want to rest your conscience insofar as some of these passages which were just thrown out to the effect that they somehow substantiate or support the Roman Catholic contention that justification starts in the waters of baptism or that salvation starts in the waters of baptism. It's simply not so. There's not one passage in Scripture that teaches that, especially John chapter 3. He must be born of the Spirit and water. It does not say you must be born of the Spirit and baptism. And how ludicrous it would be for Jesus Christ to chastise Nicodemus that he didn't understand Christian baptism before Christ was even put on the cross or had been raised from the dead. This is old covenant Jewish talk to a teacher who should have known better. It has nothing to do with ex opere operato, the Roman Catholic teaching on baptism. Now, having said that, I would just like to say something about the passage that was cited offhand insofar as us filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. This passage found in Colossians is used by Romanist apologists continuously to say that we must suffer in order to earn our salvation. We must be as Christ was in our suffering. Therefore, they like to do things that give them great pain and they enjoy the pain because they feel that it's... Uh, being as Christ was. The passage there teaches nothing of the sort. The passage teaches that the Church of God throughout the centuries until the return of Christ will fill up that which was left for them to do after the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. His death was sufficient. His death was complete. We cannot add one single drop of blood to it, but our Lord knew and the Apostle Paul knew 
that all those who wish to live a godly life in Christ Jesus would be persecuted and they would be filling up that which is lacking in the atonement of Christ, lacking by way of the entire historical milieu in which Christ, after his resurrection, ascended on high to the right hand of God and left his body, his fragile body, to be beaten and bruised by the world. It has nothing to do with adding to what Christ has already done for salvation. And then I'd like to make a remark uh, on the issue of justification. I haven't been raised in the Roman Catholic religion. I knew two things. One, I was never going to be good enough to go to heaven. That's presumptuous to think that I could go to heaven. But I also understood something else equally devastating. And that was I was never going to be bad enough to go to hell. I was suspended in between. And until you come to grips with the gospel of Jesus Christ, which says, oh yes, you are so bad that you most surely are going to go to hell. Until you see that, you cannot see the need for his righteousness, for your acceptance before God. You see, and that's what this debate is all about. You've got to come to grips with the fact that you are so utterly despicable in the eyes of God that only his righteousness will do. You try to add anything to his righteousness and you've taken away from his righteousness. Thank you. I've been dying to do that all night. So. <laughs> I'll just reset the stopwatches. And uh, now I would call upon Paul to respond for his 10 minutes also. Thanks very much, Cecil. Thank you. Um, well, I have to start by saying, uh, and on my own behalf, and on, certainly on behalf of a number of people in this room, uh, I don't think any of us have ever heard the expression Romanist before. And uh, I think we would probably feel slightly offended at being given such a title. We are Christians. The Roman Catholic Church is a Christian church. We confess the Lordship of Jesus. So uh, just to register that. Uh, Rob uh, quoted from some, I think it was the Council of Florence. Uh, but I have to point out, I'm afraid, that the last council to take place in our church is the last word. Now, it doesn't mean to say that we deny uh, previous councils or the essential of previous councils. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that we're going to have to stick by every jot and tittle in previous councils. The last council is the last word. So the last word until there's another council is Vatican II. And uh, in response to his objection to my suggestion at the beginning that uh, maybe it was possible to be saved even if you're not a Roman Catholic, I quote the dogmatic constitution on the church. And it's a dogmatic constitution, which means it carries the highest authority. Not every uh, document in the Second Vatican Council is dogmatic. Some are simply decrees, authoritative, but a dogmatic constitution carries the highest authority. So I quote uh, verse 15, uh, paragraph 15, I mean. The church knows that she is joined in many ways to the baptized who are honored by the name of Christian, but who do not, however, profess the Catholic faith in its entirety and have not preserved unity or communion under the, under the successor of Peter. For there are many who hold sacred scripture in honor as a rule of faith and of life, who have a sincere religious zeal, who lovingly believe in God the Father Almighty and in Christ the Son of God and the Savior, who are sealed by baptism which unites them to Christ and who indeed recognize and receive other sacraments in their own churches or ecclesiastical communities. Many of them possess the Episcopate, celebrate the Holy Eucharist, and cultivate devotion to the Virgin Mother of God. There is furthermore a sharing in prayer and spiritual benefits. These Christians are indeed in some real way joined to us in the Holy Spirit, for by his gifts and graces, his sanctifying power is also active in them, and he has strengthened some of them even to the shedding of their blood. So as a Roman Catholic, I can acknowledge that 
because of his obvious love of the scriptures and knowledge of the scriptures, that, uh, that I would have a degree of communion with Rob. I wouldn't just brush him aside or say or suggest that he's following a false religion. He's not. He shares quite a lot with me. Probably most important of all, uh, a love of the word of God. And in the decree on uh, ecumenism, we have the words, the brethren divided from us also carry out many liturgical actions of the Christian religion in ways that vary according to the condition of each church or community these liturgical actions most certainly can truly engender a life of grace and one must say can aptly give access to the communion of salvation. So it is official Roman Catholic teaching that uh, you can get to heaven even if you, you're not uh, fully a Roman Catholic. Although of course if you want a sure passage to heaven, become a Roman Catholic. <laughs> Now, Rob uh, talked about the sacramental system, which is a very cold term. Uh, you see, as I've said in my presentation, God appeals to us, not just to our minds, not just to our spirits, he appeals to our whole being, and we are body and soul. So sacraments, is not a system. Sacraments are encounters with the risen Lord, meetings with the Lord. A wonderful example of that would be uh, the story, which I'm sure is familiar to all of you in the room today, that beautiful story of when Jesus was called by Jairus to go and heal his daughter. And on the way, we're told that a woman in the crowd who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for a long time thought, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I shall be healed. And she came up and she touched the hem of his garment, and immediately we're told Jesus felt power going out from him. And he turned around and said, who touched me? And they laughed at him and said, there's all these people crowding around you. Uh, how could you say, who touched me? But he knew that somebody had touched him with faith. And he turned around to her and he said, woman, your faith has saved you. And that's a wonderful description of sacraments as we understand them. A sacrament is the opportunity of actually touching the living Lord Jesus. Now, there are many people, there were many people around Jesus when he was walking this earth who were totally indifferent to him. Okay, we believe, I believe, and I think probably most people in this room believe that Jesus was truly God as well as being truly man. But many people, when he walked amongst them, were totally indifferent to him. And so it is with our sacraments. Without faith, the sacrament is indeed just a bit of bread, a wafer, just a bit of wine, water or whatever but whilst we would say that Christ is truly present in that sacrament if you approach him with faith then it will be an encounter and your life will be transformed I think uh, there's a good analogy with human friendship we've all I hope we've all anyway had the experience of, of making friends uh, for me that would be the, the, the most important experience in life, the greatest of all God's gifts. But in a true friendship, we are changed, and we see our friends changed. I remember once uh, going home, uh, the second or third time I went home, back home to my parents' home with a friend of mine, and somebody said of my friend, gosh, he has changed so much since you first brought him, and that's because of your friendship. But I was more conscious of the fact that I had changed because of his friendship. And so it is with the Christian faith is all about friendship with God, friendship with the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus gives himself to us not only in his word, but in sacrament, in tangible ways. And the more we avail ourselves of these means, then the more we can deepen our friendship and the more we can be transformed and changed. And that brings me on to uh, this whole question about imputed righteousness or real righteousness. Yes, that is a difference between us, and I'm not going to pretend it isn't. Uh, it's true that in the tradition uh, which Rob represents, uh, the, uh, right, uh, justification is described in terms of imputed righteousness. And okay, that's one way of looking at it. But from our point of view, from the Roman Catholic point of view, we would see justification as the beginning of a relationship 
And like all relationships, our relationship with God can grow and deepen. And I would like to quote from somebody whom I consider probably one of the greatest theologians in this century, Henri de Lubac. Uh, and I think he describes very, very aptly, very clearly, the difference between what we might call justification by faith alone and uh, the Roman Catholic concept of justification, which is by a life, by friendship. If God had willed to save us without our own cooperation, Christ's sacrifice by itself would have sufficed. But does not the very existence of our Savior presuppose a lengthy period of collaboration on man's part? Moreover, salvation on such terms would not have been worthy of the persons that God willed us to be. God did not desire to save mankind as a wreck is salvaged. He meant to raise up within it a life, his own life. The law of redemption is here a reproduction of the law of creation. Man's cooperation was always necessary if his exalted destiny was to be reached, and his cooperation is necessary now for his redemption. Christ did not come to take our place, or rather this aspect of substitution refers only to the first stage of his work, but to enable us to raise ourselves through him to God. He came not to win for us an external pardon, that fundamentally was ours from all eternity and is presupposed by the Incarnation itself. For redemption is a mystery of love and mercy, but he came to change us inwardly. Thenceforward, humanity was to cooperate actively in its own salvation, and that is why to the act of his sacrifice, Christ joined the objective revelation of his person and the foundation of his church. To sum up, revelation and redemption are bound up together and the church is their only tabernacle. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. Right, I'm just getting myself organized here. We now come into the, uh, the question and response. Uh, section and uh, what is going to happen here is that uh, one party will put a question to the other party and that party will have uh, three minutes to uh, respond to the uh, question that's been put to them and then after they've given their response the other party who put the question will have two minutes to respond to the answer given so I hope you can follow all that <laughs> Uh, we're going to begin, and uh, Rob has the opportunity to put the first question to Paul. So, Rob, would you put your first question, please, uh, to Paul? Okay. Um, I'm not on time yet because I'm still looking for my first question, okay? <laughs> I have a question. I have many questions, of course, but uh, while you were talking, I decided to change my question, and okay, I think I'm ready to... Uh, to change my question. Can we go to four questions? No. Okay. Just kidding. No, <laughs> he knows I would ask for five after that. I think. All right. You quoted accurately from the Second Vatican Council, Lumen Gentium, uh, dogmatic constitution on the church light to the Gentiles. And in your citation, you were extremely pleased with the fact that Vatican II had made statements that were broad enough to be inclusive of salvation in those outside of the Roman Catholic religion, okay? Now, in light of that, let me ask you to respond to this citation from the same document, Lumen Gentium, paragraph 16, non-Christians and the people of God, and in light of what the Apostle Paul is going to say in Galatians chapter 1. First of all, then, the Vatican II statement, paragraph 16, Lumen Gentium. The plan of salvation includes those also who acknowledge the Creator. Foremost among these are the Muslims, they profess fidelity to the faith of Abraham and with us 
adore the one and merciful God who will judge mankind on the last day. That, in light of Galatians 1, verse 8 and 9, but though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Do you believe that the Muslims have received the gospel of Jesus Christ and as a result are to be acknowledged as part of the plan of salvation as Vatican II says? Thank you. No, obviously the Muslims have not received the fullness of the gospel, otherwise they wouldn't be Muslims, they'd be Christians. Uh, and what the document says is that it's reaching out and looking for what points we can find in, in common. And uh, obviously the Muslims, as it says here, profess to hold the same faith of Abraham. And uh, they also uh, believe in Jesus, not as God, but as a prophet. And they also have a, a, a reverence for the mother of Jesus. So uh, there are things in common. We're looking for things that we have in common, things that we can build on. We have, there's, a, there's a, an expression, lex orandi, lex credendi. The, the rule of prayer is the rule of what you believe. In other words, if you want to know what any church believes, look at the way they pray. Look at their official texts, their prayer texts. Now there's a, uh, a text which means a lot to me in uh, one of our Eucharistic prayers. Uh, we, we pray for the Pope, for our Bishop, for all our brothers and sisters in Christ, and then we pray for all who seek you with a sincere heart. Now that, that means a lot to me, and uh, we're told in uh, John that um, God so loved the world that he sent his only Son. Now, the Greek for that is cosmos, and that cosmos means the entirety of creation. So that God so loved the entirety of creation, every, every being, and longs for everyone, as we have in, uh, in, in elsewhere in scripture, to come to knowledge of the truth. I can call. Uh, I get to respond. To yes, that. you have two minutes to respond to that. Okay. Call. I noticed that you did not read the first sentence of the citation, so I'm just going to read that again. The plan of salvation includes those also who acknowledge the Creator. Now, if it's true that anybody in any religion out there who acknowledges the Creator within their religion are saved. It makes no sense to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It makes the Apostle Paul here off base in his proclamation that anyone who comes to you with a different gospel or a different plan of salvation is accursed. He, he would have to change this to say, well, they don't have the fullness of salvation, but nevertheless, they are still in the fold, so to speak, because they recognize a creator God. In fact, the document goes on to say that Hinduism, in Hinduism, men explore the divine mystery and express it both in the limitless riches of myth and the accurately defined insights of philosophy. In Hinduism, they seek release from the trials of the present life by ascetical practices, profound meditation, and recourse to God in confidence and love. Buddhism in its various forms, testifies to the essential inadequacy of this changing world. It proposes a way of life by which men can, with confidence and trust, attain a state of perfect liberation and reach supreme illumination, either through their own efforts or by the aid of divine help. Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam, with one stroke of the pen, included in the fold of God, if they would only seek God in their own religious experience. Based upon that knowledge, I think we're going to have to take out Galatians 1, 8, and 9. If we, or an angel from heaven, 
preach any other gospel. <laughs> Got me. Now then, uh, Paul, you have the opportunity to frame a question to Rob. Pity I can't respond to that, anyway. Uh, well, uh, I, at the beginning of my talk, I shared how I came to meet the living Lord. Uh, Rob, you shared an awful lot of texts and quotations and uh, a lot of erudition, but uh, it certainly didn't pick up from, from what you shared with us how you actually came to meet the living Lord, so I'd be interested to hear that. Okay, that's a fair question. Uh, I'm going to say this tongue-in-cheek, so uh, I, I might say of my conversion to Christ that it was cooperative. I was running away from God as fast as I could, and he reached down and saved me. Uh, that's, that's just tongue-in-cheek. No, in fact, I having been raised a, a Roman Catholic and having gone through many times the uh, obediences of the Roman Catholic religion and having been taught the sacramental system, etc., found that I had never been exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I had never heard the word of God. It was not taught systematically or straightforwardly, either in catechism or in the brief uh, homilies that the priest would give on a Sunday morning. And having not found any of the gospel in my experience in the Roman Catholic religion, I was confronted at long last by a man who came to me with nothing in his hand but a Bible. And he asked me a simple question. He said, if you were to die today and stand at the edge of heaven and God said, why should I let you in? What would your answer be? And I said to him, I'm a pretty good guy. I'm not as bad as most. I, mean, I get along. I do this and do that. And he went, ah, wrong answer. I said, why? He said, because you're not a good guy. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You see, you fall into the wrath and condemnation of God. Natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foreign to him. And you're under the judgment of God. And I, boy, I was angry, you see, because I don't, nobody wants to hear that they're under the judgment of God. But yet, God used that message that I was unacceptable in his sight to break down the religious facade, couldn't fall back on my Roman Catholic background, and he penetrated my own darkness with the marvelous light of the revelation of him. And uh, at that time, I fell down on my knees and I cried out to God in simple faith and I said, Save me, O Lord, for I am a sinner. I have no hope apart from Christ. And in, in so doing, the flood of light and the absolute certainty of forgiveness of sin based solely upon the finished work of Christ became mine. And I knew it, and as I read his word for the first time with eyes to see, to see and, and heard it with ears to hear, I came to the understanding of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And the first thing I did was I went back and witnessed to my parish priest. And he said, I'll not hear that. Away with you. That is not the gospel you were raised in, and that is not the road to salvation. And I went around witnessing to all of my Roman Catholic friends. Well, I have to respond. Yes, uh, Paul, you have uh, two minutes to respond to that. Okay, thanks very much, Rob. Thanks. That was that was very vivid. That was uh, very good. Well, obviously, I have to say. And I feel profoundly sad that you didn't meet the living Lord in your Roman Catholic tradition. Uh, I have no hope but Christ. That's good Catholic theology. Uh, we have no hope but Christ either. There's no, there's no possible way of getting to heaven uh, except by faith in Christ. As it says in many of these documents I've got in front of me, everyone must have faith without which no man can be saved. Uh, and I would just, just as, as you mentioned, you know, the, 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 the Bible, um, you know, the Bible is, is certainly the Word of God. The Bible is the inspired Word of God. As I said in my exposition, the living Lord speaks through the Bible, both Old and New Testament, and certainly any of my parishioners, and a number of them here tonight, uh, they will certainly 
uh, back me up and say that I frequently preach uh, the importance of reading the Bible and urge them all to read the Bible on their own at home. But uh, the Bible came at a certain point in the history of the church, as I said. The Bible in its present form was put together in the third or fourth century. So the, the living tradition of the church existed before the written word came to be compiled in that present form. And when it was compiled, those books that we have were kept, but an awful lot of other books, like the Gospel of James, the Gospel of Peter, and so on, were put aside. So, you know, there was a living tradition. I'm just very sad that you didn't meet the living Lord in the living tradition. All right, thank you. Well, now we uh, move again to uh, Rob. He has the opportunity to put his second question to Paul. Paul, if you could, please tell us what is the Roman Catholic definition of grace and faith in light of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 9? Ephesians chapter 2. Right. Verses 1 to 9, I have to read it. Um, would you like the, the chairman to perhaps read that? Would yes, that, we'll that... give you an extra minute. To read. Yeah. Can I have your Bible, please? Who's in charge here? Can I have your Bible, please? It's as well I knew where to find it. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay. Well, uh, certainly the, the Roman Catholic teaching is that we cannot, no man, no person can take a single step towards their salvation without the initiative of God. So the initiative has to come from God, and that is, that is his grace. And gra the grace, grace of God is available to us uh, as a result of the death of Christ on the cross, the one perfect, complete, and all-sufficient sacrifice to take away the sins of the whole world. Uh, St. John says, the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. And in John's theology, the glorification is the, is the death of Jesus on the cross. In his death, then the Spirit is, is given, grace is given. That's God's initiative. And we can we we, we can uh, uh, be, be avail of that grace and be saved. I was one, I was trying. It was a bit difficult because I was trying with one ear to listen to Cecil reading, and I was also trying to find uh, something what the, what the Council of Trent has to say on uh, on on grace. Shall I read it? Yes, your time. Yes. Uh, a brief description of the sinner's justification, its manner under the dispensation of grace. In these words, a description is outlined of the justification of the sinner as being a transition from the state in which man is born, a son of the first Adam, to the state of grace and adoption as sons of God through the second Adam, Jesus Christ our Savior. After the promulgation of the gospel, this transition cannot take place without the bath of regeneration or the desire for it, as it is written, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 
Thank you, Paul. Uh, Rob, would you like to respond to that? Yes, this is precisely why I believe that the Roman Catholic religion is not a Christian religion. For even in quoting the Council of Trent in the definition of grace, in their understanding of grace, the Romanist position is betrayed. It is betrayed by the simple word of God. In the Romanist position, the issue that comes forward is that grace is something that can be brought about by man through a sacramental observance. The waters of baptism bring forth grace. Confirmation brings forth grace. The Eucharist brings forth grace. The unbloody sacrifice of uh, an unbloody victim in the Mass brings forth grace. The sacramental system brings forth grace. That's why I asked for a definition of grace. In the Catholic religion, grace is almost defined as an immaterial substance that is transfused into the soul in order to make that person complete enough to be taken home by God. This is not the Christian definition of grace, nor is it the Christian position, as I outlined early on. When a Roman Catholic says we are saved by grace through faith, he means we are saved by the grace that comes from God out of heaven by virtue of obedience to the sacraments, he says, are left by Christ. And when he says we are saved by faith, he means that we are saved by faith in that sacramental system. He said earlier, faith makes the sacrament real. That's not true. Faith doesn't make anything real. Either it's real or it's not. And I quote uh, from uh, any of you who have been involved with the Mormon religion. They have great faith. They have great faith that Jesus appeared over here. They have great faith in Mormon, Moroni, Joseph Smith, and all this business. Their faith doesn't make that real. Faith makes nothing real. Either it is revealed in the Word of God as truth, or it is not. Your faith cannot make something real. <coughs> no, it is uh, Paul's opportunity to put his second question second. to Rob. Yes, well, uh, I, ha I have to say, I'm afraid, that I, I didn't say that uh, uh, faith makes... Sorry, uh, sorry, I have to be strict there. Can you just confine it to the question, please, Paul? Thank you. Um... All right. I imagine, you're probably a bit younger than me, but uh, I would imagine you may possibly have known, pe known and loved people who have, uh, who have died. Um, would you consider that you have any kind of ongoing fellowship with those people? There perhaps could be admitted to an ongoing fellowship with those who have departed only in the sense of my hopes for them, in the sense of appealing to those who have died as though they were saints in heaven, as appealing to them in the sense of the uh, 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 issuance of prayer or what the Roman Catholic religion calls the invoking of the saints for special favors from the Lord Jesus Christ, or the invoking of Mary for special favors from her son, or the invoking of the dead for anything. This is anathema to the Christian religion. The fellowship would only be one of a vicarious hope in that that person who has died has died safely in Christ by faith alone in his finished work. And after that, we trust that uh, we'll all be brought together in the eternal kingdom as part of the heavenly uh, choir singing Amazing Grace, of course. But in the meanwhile, we do not have a relationship with them that is an invoking prayer to or uh, physical, emotional, psychological, or spiritual relationship with them, no, sir. Okay, well, I noticed you said the word hope, so uh, obviously that implies that you wouldn't be certain when somebody dies whether they've gone to heaven or hell, and that must be very disturbing. Uh, I must say that when I think of members of my own family or very close friends who, who have died, uh, I would be very disturbed if I thought that they were not, that I was not still in communion with them. But it's not just something I think, 
you know, this would be very much part of my experience, just as I've experienced the Lord Jesus in what you call a sacramental system, what I would call a sacramental encounter. Uh, so I have experienced the, the wonder of ongoing fellowship with my, my parents, for example, and uh, well, I'll not give a whole litany of friends, but uh, they would be very, very real, and I find that a very a very comforting part of my pilgrimage through this world to heaven. Thank you. And uh, now we come to Rob has his third question to Paul, in spite of what it says in your order there, as your misprint. Uh, Rob, you have the opportunity to put a question to Paul now, your third question. <coughs> You're right. I have to ask a question. I can't make a statement. Um, Talk to you afterwards about it. Okay, okay. <laughs> Paul, in light of Romans 3.28, Romans 4.5, and Titus 3.5, what good works and merits do you believe are taken into account for your justification? In light of 328, 4, 5, and Titus 3, 5, what good works and merits do you believe are taken into account by God for your justification? Okay. Well, uh, Romans 3, 28, I've got in front of We maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. That, of course, referring to the Jewish law. So we don't observe the Jewish law. Uh, what was the other one? 4, four 5. 4, 5. However, to the man who does not work but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. Well, it doesn't make any reference to, 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 to works. And the other one Excuse me? The man any... who does not... No, I beg your pardon. Now, when a man works... Is this it? Four or five? No, yeah. four. Romans four or five. However, to the man who does not work but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. Well, as I said earlier, you know, we, we can't do anything to, uh, to twist God's arm. We can't, uh, we can't force the issue. Grace is God's free gift. And the other was Titus 3.5. one of the quotations I've put in. 3, 5. He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. And that, that's 3.5a. If you go on to 3.5b, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having hope of eternal life. Well, as I say, the... You know, salvation, in my understanding, and as I believe in the understanding of my church, is all about a relationship, a relationship with the living Lord Jesus. And a relationship has to change us, has to make a difference to the way we live. And, you know, my, I couldn't deepen friendships, uh, my human friendships, if I didn't make phone calls, write letters, make appointments, go out for meals, a whole host of things, if I let those if I didn't bother with those, then the relationship would peter out. So it is with my relationship with the Lord Jesus. I've got to nurture, nourish that relationship. And I do that through listening to him, speaking to me in his word, and through touching him as he comes to me in the sacraments, and also as he comes to me through my fellow Christians. Uh, obviously, the, the privileged place of encounter is, uh, is, is my own diocese, and even more specifically, my own uh, parish. Um, but I also rejoice to say that I, I also enjoy fellowship with many Christians who come from other traditions. Now all that is part of, of, uh, part of the work, if you like, which nourishes and deepens my relationship with my Savior. Um, but also, and Jesus makes this very clear in Matthew 25, when he says that whatever you do to the least of my brethren, you do to me. So that, as I explained, you know, in our worship, when we go to church, 
when we, we celebrate the Eucharist, when we meet the risen Lord, we're then sent back out into the world to bring his love in a practical way to the world. It's not that bringing that love somehow earns us salvation, it's the response to the encounter. But also in showing practical love to my brothers and sisters, I'm also deepening my relationship with Jesus. Whatever you did to the least of my brethren, you did to me. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, Rob, you have two minutes to uh, respond. To stay on track here, Paul, I want you to listen very carefully to the undeniable words of the greatest counsel of your own religion when it comes <coughs> to justification and works. My question was designed to ask you what good works and merits you believe will be taken into account by God for your justification. And I assume by your answer that God will take into account your willingness to dine with Jesus, sup with Jesus, come in contact with Jesus, um, um, partake of Jesus in the Eucharist, Mass, etc. So I'm going to assume that those are the good works that you believe will be taken into account by God for your justification. However, the great council of Trent says it plainly, solidly, and simply. And I encourage you to teach this to your flock as a faithful minister to them. Hence, to those who work well unto the end and trust in God, eternal life is to be offered both as a grace mercifully promised to the sons of God through Christ Jesus and as a reward promised by God himself to be faithfully given to their good works and merits. That is justification by faith plus works. Hunky dory, hand in hand they go. It's repeated over and over again in the Council of Trent until it comes to this resounding climax. If anyone says that the justice received from God is not preserved and also not increased before God through good works, but that those works are merely the fruits and signs of justification obtained and not the cause of its increase, let him be anathema. You see, Paul, this is the difference between you and me. Uh, you are holding out for a relational relationship with Jesus surrounded by um, warm, fuzzy feelings in, in love and relationship through uh, sacramentals. And I'm saying, no, 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 no. It's much too serious of a matter for this. Now we come to uh, the opportunity for Paul to put his last question uh, to Rob. Paul, your final question. Thank you. And I was trying to find the precise quotations. I wanted to ask Rob now uh, a specific question on a quotation. I think it's in 1 Corinthians 4. But, uh, ah, yes, here we are. I found it. 1 Corinthians 4, uh, verses, verse 5. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. Each will receive his praise from God. Now, you were just berating me for, as you thought, looking for praise from God in addition to faith. How do you deal with that? Well, I think it's absolutely true that we will receive praise from God by virtue of uh, having walked in faith and we have nothing against sanctification although we've been talking justification this evening every Christian knows once he has come in contact with the Savior that the Savior has asked him to walk in faith and to um, commit himself to the prospect of being faithful unto the Word of God and unto the moral commands of Scripture but no Christian would dare 
hold up that faithfulness before God as though it were the key to the door of heaven. No Christian would say, here, Lord, uh, I deserve some praise. I mean, after all, I came in contact with you, and look how good and faithful I have been. Will you then justify me and give me your praise? Absolutely not. And what you have not read is the first four verses of 1 Corinthians 4, which I will answer your question further by reading these. Let a man so account of us as of ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judges me is the Lord. What Paul is saying is that he cannot justify himself. He knows nothing against himself, but he cannot thereby justify himself. Why? Because nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. I cannot look at God and say, I believe I am justified. Paul is saying the one who justifies is God. And that's why he says in Philippians 3, 9, that I might be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, but the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of sacraments, friendly relationships, plugging into Jesus, Obedience now. But the righteousness from God that is on the basis of faith. And it's not a faith that believes that God has given us good works to do. It's a faith that believes that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to all who believe in him. Romans 10 and verse 5. Thank you, uh, indeed, uh, Rob. Paul, you have the opportunity to respond to that. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, well, that, that was an absolute travesty, of course, of uh, the Roman Catholic position to say, to suggest that I would, or any Roman Catholic would hold up their, anything they'd done and say, look, uh, I deserve some praise from this. The whole point of quoting that verse was to, to indicate that the praise comes as a surprise. I mean, I've often quoted that, say, when celebrating a funeral. Uh, as a word of, uh, of comfort and consolation to the family, that we, we can't, it's not for us to judge, for good or for bad. Um, but we have a word of consolation there in Holy Scripture that uh, the praise comes from God. I mean, sometimes you go to a funeral and uh, the, the, the homily, so-called, uh, is a kind of panegyric. Um, Whereas uh, I, well, another verse I would quote at practically every funeral is all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, we depend entirely upon God's gracious mercy. But as a word of comfort, I like to look at that 1 Corinthians 4. Each will receive his praise from God. It's not us judging either ourselves or, or, or other people, but God will judge us. But God is looking for what's good in us. God is not looking for ways of condemning us, putting us down. God is looking at ways to save us. Okay, Paul, thank you very much indeed. Uh, for the benefit of Trevor, uh, we're now coming to the closing statements, and I think he wants to organize tape accordingly. Or are we organized okay? That's good. Well, we come to just the final section uh, of our uh, meeting tonight. Uh, and this is where each of the gentlemen have five minutes to uh, make their closing statement. And uh, we're going to begin uh, with Paul. He has the first opportunity uh, to make his closing statement. Thanks very much, Cecil. Thank you. Well, I just want to, Rob has made a lot of reference to Romans and Galatians. And I know there are uh, chapters of the New Testament which were particularly dear to the Reformers at the time of the Reformation. I would like to uh, just quote a couple of verses from Romans 2, uh, verse 7. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. 
and Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I would like to address these concluding remarks, not to the Reformed churches as I have come to know and love them, for I have many close friends who belong to the Reformed churches here in Northern Ireland. Uh, I have love not only of individual Christians in the Presbyterian, Methodist, Church of Ireland, and so on, Baptist, uh, but I would also have a relationship and a friendship and a respect with different congregations with whom I've had the pleasure and privilege of worshipping. So I'm certainly not addressing these concluding remarks to the Reformed churches as such, and certainly not to any individual Protestant friends, many of whom I know are here in this room tonight. But uh, I address these remarks to the Reformed religion as presented this evening by Robert Zins, and to those of you in this room who identify with that presentation. Brothers and sisters of the Reformed tradition, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is infinitely greater, infinitely more loving, infinitely more merciful than the narrow and, to my mind, mean image you have presented of him. I pray for you, Rob, as I pray for myself and for all Christians, both Catholic and Protestant, that we, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love which surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thank you very much, Paul, for your closing comments. And uh, Rob, you now have five minutes to make your closing summary also. It is difficult in some cases to present the gospel of Jesus Christ straightforwardly and even handedly because you run the risk of being accused of being unloving. You run the risk of being accused of somehow reshaping or reforming the picture of God that is in the minds of your audience. That is why I am very careful to try to quote scriptures in their context and to explain context against context. I wish to be put in the same consideration as those men and women who have gone before me, who have strove in their lives to be committed only to the revelation of God as he has revealed himself in Lagos, in the Word, in Scripture. For if I go outside of Scripture, and begin forming a picture of God based upon my personality, my background, based upon my relationship with people, based upon my feelings, based upon my mother's death or my father's death, or based upon any other kind of emotion. I have not done justice to the revelation of God. Therefore, I shall run the risk of not pleasing man, but pleasing God, and showing forth the revelation of God as he has revealed it. And I will grant to you that my opponent has a very ironic and sweet disposition, and has a magnanimous personality willing to extend forth human love, perhaps even to a greater extent than I could imagine. However, lest you are fooled by the human emotion of love, should we not check on 
his representation of God to see whether or not it measures with the scriptural data? Or am I to be taken in by a smooth talking, loving, flattering, winsome Jehovah Witness who may come knocking at my door? Or am I to be taken in by a teetotaling, non-coffee drinking, non-military pacifist Mormon who will come to me spruced up in his white shirt and his best dress tie, close cropped hair, urgently delivering unto me a message of salvation with the gentle sweetness and kindness that those people are so well known for? Or am I to be swept away by the Dalai Lama and his Pulitzer Prize for peaceful resolution to the conflict in Tibet? Or should I be cast down the river with the likes of all those social reformers, Mahatma Gandhi and his love for people, love for mankind, and love for God, if there is a God, for he rejected Christianity in its entirety. No, I think not. I think that the gospel we have received and the gospel we are to stand and protect and the gospel we are to preach and teach, the gospel we are to live by and die by is the gospel that is delivered once and for all to the saints. And it cannot be compromised by sweetness, <coughs> nor can it be compromised by anybody's personality and anybody's assessment of the way God must be. If that is the case, all of you have a God of your own making, for you are all made differently. You have different personalities, different emotions. And if it's true that God has revealed himself in this manner, that all men are condemned, they're under the wrath of God, having been judged already, John 3 and 17. If it is true that none seek after God, no, not one, for they all together have come undone. If it's true that there's no fear of God in the eyes of the unregenerate, if it is true by nature they are children of wrath, shouldn't we deliver unto them the liberating gospel of Jesus Christ? For only that and that alone can separate them from their sinful pride and their sinful selves. So it is we run the risk of not presenting the faith of the reformers. I did not quote once John Knox or John Calvin. I did not quote once Martin Luther. I did not quote once not one single reformer with purpose. I quoted the word of God and read it straight up and asked you to consider which way of salvation pours forth from the pages of the New Testament. Baptismal regeneration in the sacrament of baptism for infants in the light of a believing father or mother at the font of a Roman Catholic priest. The calling down of the Spirit of God from a Roman Catholic bishop making the sign of the cross with chrism on the forehead of a young teenager to make an indelible print upon the heart of that person. The representation of the crucifixion and death of Jesus Christ in the Mass, the adoration of the wafer, the elevation of Mary to co-mediatrix and co-redemptress in the Roman Catholic religion, the institution of purgatory for suffering and pain, purgation and cleaning after death, bought and paid for by Masses, said for the duly departed, extreme unction, where was the biblical proof for all of these doctrines? Where was the biblical proof for the Roman Catholic way of salvation? Where was the statement of the great Apostle Paul or of Peter to the effect that this is what Christ has left for us? And then, of course, going beyond that, my Roman Catholic friend was bound and determined to say that the Roman Catholic religion now believes that anyone who seeks God in their own way is within the fold of salvation, for they are sincere in their hearts. That the Muslims, and the Hindus, and the Buddhists, 
and all those animists in Africa who are pursuing God according to nature are found to be acceptable by God because God is magnanimous and he's loving and I quote, he is looking for ways to save us. Well, our friends, on your behalf, I want to thank both Paul and Rob for giving of their time, not just tonight, but in the many hours of preparation that have gone into preparing what they had to say and the questions that they framed. I want to thank them for the manner in which they conducted it. I want to thank you for the manner in which you listened to it. His, uh, Rob will be in the country and doing some more debates, uh, but this is uh, Paul's work finished in uh, relation to uh, the visit of Rob. And uh, I just personally want to give him a little gift, a little reminder uh, of his visit with us tonight. And I do want to thank him for his cooperation and for uh, taking part tonight. So, Paul, thank you very much. And so that brings our debate to an end. And again, I, I want to thank you and I wish you all a very safe journey home to wherever you're traveling on tonight. Thank you very much indeed.